Ladies and gentlemen, both of us at different times in history had a chance to contribute to what we're about to present today. I got, as my second system, got to help design the Atari 8-bit computers. And as part of that, we left groundwork for people that we didn't know what it would be decades later. And so decades later, Tom led the team that built these guys adding network adapters to a 45-year-old machine. And it was absolutely fun doing it. And I thank Joe from the bottom of my heart to that, that, that this was all made possible. There were so many wonderful hooks that were put in place here and I hope going through this presentation here, we'll see all the bits and pieces that he left that I was able to take and capitalize on. Well, I contributed. I wasn't the main architect of the software. What we did know, though, is that we needed to plan for things that we couldn't yet foresee. True. So, we're going to talk about the original development work, which I was involved in, and then we're going to talk about development of this thing, and we're going to list a few places where you can learn some more. Because as a public speaker, I always know that if we do a good job of explaining what it is, how it works, what it's good for, then you'll come out wanting to learn more about it. And you'll be able to contribute yourself someday. So that's two of us. Um, one of the luckiest days in my life that didn't involve the births of my children was Thanksgiving weekend of 1975. I lost a job doing medical research and I interviewed at Atari. And I'm not a gamer, but I wanted to apprentice myself to a guy named Jay Miner, who was the lead designer of this machine. And I had played an Atari arcade video game at Disneyland a few blocks from here in the summer of 1975. So when I was interviewed to work at Atari, I was self-educated on the 6502. The previous speaker was talking about those. I had bought the 6502 myself in September of 1975. And so I aced the technical interview, not knowing why I interviewed, aced the technical interview. And then they took me through the lobby of Atari and said, you want to play a game? And I panicked for a moment, thinking, uh-oh. I've played that game before. So I stood and looked at Atari Tank. And they said, you want to play Tank? And I said, yeah. I played three games with the interview, and I won one of the three games. I was hired on the spot. <laughs> That's how I got this job. And I got to work on the first machine. I got to write the code for the combat cartridge with played tank. And then we got to do our second system, which was the machine we're talking about here. Pass the torch. From me, I took that second system that they designed. It was the first machine of my own. There were other computers in my house, but it was the first machine that was my own that I learned how to program on and learned it from top to bottom every register, every address, every single thing that it could do. And that prepared me for a long-term career right now. Fast forward to today, I do research and development work at, uh, for DevOps at Ericsson Global. And so because the work in DevOps has very long development cycles and I can wait hours at a time to do certain things, I can time slice my time very creatively to work on these projects like FujiNet, which has allowed me to leverage the bits and pieces that I've been able to do in cross-platform development, cross-platform engineering to take and build something that we were able to start here on the Atari and to bring to potentially hundreds of platforms in the very near future. All right. So. I got lucky. So we started working on 
this computer system as soon as we were ready to start shipping the Atari game console. And it was, that was a big hit. Sold 30 million units over 10 years. You can still buy them now. Atari was reassembled and recently I was at an electronics store and I bought a version of it re-implemented in FPGA that had HDMI output. This is what my children want because my children don't want the old ones that drive CRTs because you can't buy them anymore. They're too bulky. <laughs> Given that success, Atari knew that we needed a follow-up system. The founders knew that the competitors would see it and want to eat our lunch. And they did try hard to eat our lunch. Later they did, but not right away. And we thought when we sold that game console that we're going to sell maybe three years worth before our competitor, we or our competitors had to replace it. So given we were, we had two overlapping things we wanted to do. We wanted to build the next great game machine and we wanted to build a personal computer which have some overlapping things, but they're different in some other ways. Um, I've given separate talks, some of which are recorded by BCF, on um, three generations of animation machines. If you look um, from last summer, it's recorded there. So I don't want to go deep into the animation part. But stepping back, we also wanted a great personal computer. And if you look at what you do with computers back in the day, you typed, you managed data, maybe if you were adventurous, you programmed. And programmed in, well, the big killer app for the Apple II was VisiCalc, which was a start, way of starting to what if on business designs. So looking at this, when we started this development, we said, okay, we're trying to do all these things. So we did a couple of things. We hired a couple of consultants and we drafted our main game writers to um, code their design. And the consultants were looking at common deck mini computers, PDP-8s, PDP-11s, things like that. And those things had things called IO control blocks in them. So here is a list of people who deserve a lot of credit for this. And we were leveraging common knowledge at the time. I didn't know yet that we were going to need to support a network device, but we wanted to leave enough room so that that was possible. Click. So it had ROM-based stuff inside. The game console had no software in, in it at all. In fact, it didn't even have any interrupts. But this machine had interrupts, it had a default application which was just typing on the, on the screen. So it had a 8K byte BIOS, basic input output system, that was resident. And if you plugged in a floppy disk based mass storage, it had a DOS operating system that ran on top of that. But what we're focusing here is basically how the thing itself works. And we wanted it to have device-independent I.O. It doesn't just, it's not like controller-specific or I.O.-specific. You can either send characters to things or blocks of data to things or stream data to things. And to do that, we wanted to be extensible. We built a CIO system and then the, S, the serial I.O. system that connected out of it was extensible and that and as part of that we were how shall I say you can say we were lucky or yeah, a bit. looking ahead thinking we don't know what people are going to try to do with this but we want to allow, allow simple plug and play so the SIO system will go out to the serial devices and download what amounts to device drivers they call them device handlers same idea um, so one could plug in something new and it could download how to talk to it and the rest of the system would just know. And the applications can capitalize on it. That was plug and play. So what's in an IO control block? Um, I'm not going to read you the whole slide, but basically it's which number of devices is it? 
and which number within it, like if you've got several serial ports on an 850, those have numbers. If you've got several disk drives on a system, those will have numbers. Um, which command are you going to execute, which is listed on the next slide? And there are there's status bits that come back to say, well, you tried to do an I.O., what happened? Was it successful or was it not successful? Um, there are some 16-bit addresses pointing to where the data is, where you are within the data block, um, and there's some extra e extensions, which we don't know what you're going to need, but there's 32 bytes auxiliary at the tail end, which we don't know what they're going to need, but there's some room for them to expand. So we did all that. So this, the obvious things for any of you familiar with programming before, any devices, you want to open it. You want to close it if you're done with it. Um, either give me the characters it's given me, or here's some characters I want you to send. You can say characters, or you can say, here's the whole record. Send that record. I want that whole record. Please give it to me. I want to get your status in more detail. And we, again, the kitchen sink. Had a special, had a placeholder for, we don't know what it's going to be yet, but somebody will figure it out. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, they did. That. <laughs> so the base machine knows about the editor. And the editor is, you type keys, and it just shows up. Memo pad, we called it. Didn't do anything important, but it worked. Uh, the screen was a device. The keyboard was a device. The printer was a device out on the serial bus. The diskette was a device on the serial bus. The 232 adapters were on an 850 on, on serial devices. And they drove a truck through that hole. Yeah. So, so what we wound up doing as far as Fujinet was concerned was we took those features that he started with here and we did two things. We integrated into what was already existing. So we added, uh, we could simulate the disk drive so that you can load software into the FujiNet. But we also uh, simulated the printer so you can take and print to it. And it rasterizes out into a PDF. And we also even implemented the 850 interface so that it would work with existing comms programs. I think you're, yeah. you're, you're just one slide ahead of yourself. Did there I? you are. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we, and so we implemented those three that already existed, but then we turned right around and added a new network device that could take and bring the entire internet in. And to do that, we actually wound up implementing a whole handler using the mechanisms that were described before to be loaded in off of that device and to use that extra big microcontroller that's sitting on that device right there and treat it like a giant I.O. processor, doing all the heavy lifting and making all of this possible. And you can use the FujiNet, because this was done in a layered approach, you can use the FujiNet directly over the SIO layer, or you can use the handler that we provided so that you can use it from in places like Atari Basic or Atari Writer. So, like we said right here, and because we had all this extra space, I've already kind of touched on all these bits and pieces here, but because we had all this space inside the FujiNet, we were able to take and create protocol adapters to talk to different internet protocols. And you can see a list of them right here. And you can see a couple of them right here, SSH and HTTP, that require crypto. It can handle, the ASP32 handles that just fine. So not only that, but we even had space to put in uh, a JSON parser and an XML parser. So you want to do all off? Fine, no problem. You want to talk to Google Drive? Sure, no problem. The Atari, was, the Atari interface was just generic enough to, to take and let this happen and to let programs actually use it. Because all it's caring about is, here, open this connection here. Do this, do this, boom, to sending commands off. Let's see, what's the next one? So we wound up choosing, because of all this stuff that Joe and his team had put in in the first place, we were able to come right in and model an ideal platform for network devices for 8-bit machines. We were able to integrate into the bits and pieces that, uh, that they laid down. And 
Even so, uh, one thing I was telling Joe earlier, I'm glad that they had the foresight on the SIO port to put two interrupt pins. So we can say, the, so the Fujinet can say, hey, I've got some packets you need to service. And the Atari goes, oh, okay. So we're not having to constantly pull it. So the little things that engineers can do to help out in the future can pay off in ways that are completely and utterly unexpected. And because of that, we were able to capitalize and do all of these amazing things. So as far as the Atari SIO is concerned, it provided everything that was needed to do all the low level input and output. So you could say, you could, you could ask for a particular block of information and you had a field so that you had up to 255 potential addressable devices. This really helped for us because it allowed us to enumerate the Fujinet control device, the eight virtual disk devices, the printer device, the eight available network devices that we have exposed, the virtual SAM, and so on and so on. They made it an entire 8-bit field. Thank you for that. They didn't go, well, we'll just make it 4 bits. So, um, so for example, those of you who like to have a lot of tabs open on your browser, mm -hmm. eight internet, you can have eight internet things lit at yes, the same time. at the same time. And the ESP32 will just go, okay, sure. And I'll do the, the bounce back and forth. So uh, for, for that and make that happen, so the core of everything that we're doing on the FujiNet is we're listening for this command pin to go low, and at which point we send the, it, sends, it sends a frame saying, okay, this is the device we want to talk to, this first byte. The second byte is the command that we want to send, eight bits as well. Then we have the three and four, bytes three and four here, which are the 16-bit auxiliary parameters. For the disk drive, that's the sector you want to load. For the network device, those are the number of bytes you want to take and shuffle across, and so on. And finally, we've got a simple uh, eight-bit roll-around checksum here uh, that, we, that just kind of simple error checking. Mm -hmm. And because they had done this simple protocol that was easy to implement here, all we had to do was make sure that we obeyed the SIO protocols, obeyed the timings, and uh, make sure that we're not, we're not wasting bandwidth too much. The interrupt pins really help with that. And we were able to take the uh, information that's been kind that of passed be down. Lit. Yeah. Okay, due to an error. All right. Um, I have network connection on this machine, and I think I typed this it. Is a, this is a link to the Altera Hardware Reference Manual. If you want to take and Google this up. Avery. This is also in the slides. Mm -hmm. the sli they are going to post the slides, so after they post them, you can download these things and you can run with them. This is, right now, the modern Bible for Atari hardware development. Avery has spent an unbelievable amount of time putting everything together so that you know how the hardware works from top to bottom and things like how the SIO protocol works and so on. We used this right here specifically when we were doing our bring-up. And it would have been a much harder otherwise. So, just as an example of an SIO command, when, uh, when you turn on your Atari here, you're actually, when you hear that raspberry sound, if you have nothing connected, what you're actually hearing are these command frames going out right here. So this first one right here is read that first sector from drive one here, 010 zero, on zero, read sector one with the appropriate checksum. Can and you something? Yeah. Yes. So when we were doing the development of the system, we were testing it with a prototype for an external disk drive. And the programmers had inadvertently left sound on. And the marketing people said, that's a good thing. Yes. Because a lot of people working with stuff, they are comforted when there's some physical evidence that something is going on. And so they like hearing that sound. It says, it's alive. It's doing something. Because if it was really quiet, they'd think, is it dead? Should I hit the reset button? No. And so that was a bug which became a feature. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. And it is, yes, it is, it is a wonderful feature because not only can you tell that something's going on, but if you listen for long enough, you can tell what's going on. Is it working as intended? It really worked out well. Let's see here. So uh, an ex another, the, another example here, we saw how to take and do it from the disk drive. But the same mechanism here can be used to open a network connection with the FujiNet here. The difference is, is now we're talking to a different device ID, the first network device here. We have eight of them allocated. We have a command 4E, which is the Ataski O for open. We want to say uh, open and read write mode. And we did this because this mirrors the same uh, bits that are used in CIO to, rep to represent whether or not we're going to use the read or the write portion of a channel. And we use the second auxiliary byte here. Thank you again for adding these ex extra little, little header bits right over here. We didn't know what we didn't know. Yes. And so we've left a few doors. Bill Joy's like Maxim. <laughs> so not all the smart people work for you. Uh, so we, had, we used this second byte here to say, okay, I want you to do some end of line translation because the Atari used a different end of line convention. And so we want to be able to take and translate back and forth and add character turns or line feeds when we need to. So we have this and we have a payload right here to open a connection up to google.com. And depending on whether or not that is successful or not, we get either a, we get an acknowledgement and when it happens, it's a, when, it's, when it finally finishes, there's a timeout in between the acknowledgement and what can happen. So uh, it'll either give me a complete, say, okay, we did it, or error, there's a problem. And at which point we can then ask for more information through a status to see what actually happened. Which we then took the layers that, we, that were built on the SIO and all the commands that we implemented at the SIO level and pass them up into the end handler for the CIO. And so we had to implement all of the commands that we mentioned before, open, close, get, put, status, and special. And then we had to take and allocate some memory inside the Atari just to hold uh, bits and pieces as they were shuffling into the system. This is especially important because CIO itself is character oriented. It works one character at a time with some interesting exceptions. That's uh, there's, there are some things that the Atari DOS people did to take and make things faster with burst mode. Uh, some interesting abuses there. And, um, <laughs> but we were able to take and uh, pass all of these commands, convert them to SIO parameters on the fly inside the handler, send out the SIO commands using the SIO vector that's in the operating system ROM that's always there, always with the machine, and then we figure out, uh, based on that, uh, whether or not we got a complete or an error. And then if we got an error, then we send an additional status command to actually take and do uh, all the bits and pieces that we need from that point. And the slide actually has a link here to the source code for the end device handler. It's not that big at all. It's maybe a couple hundred lines of code, not counting the relocator. 6502 code relocation is an interesting black art. <laughs> I understand that. I mean, the 6502 was simple and adequate, and it didn't support code relocation. Not at all. No. You really had to get creative there. And it was a particularly interesting problem for Wozniak, because when Wozniak designed the Apple II, he designed, you know, a a two to eight decoder for eight slots in the Apple II, and then he decoded eight 1K byte ROM boundaries. And so if you know that you're gonna plug your particular card into a particular slot, you can write for that slot, but it's difficult to write independent code <coughs> to plug something into more than one slot. So people who design Apple II Peripherals tend to put them always in the same slot every mm -hmm. time. Or my personal favorite, I saw so many Apple device handlers literally implemented using nothing but branches and doing relative branch addressing. <laughs> so That's uh, the only way. Yeah, it, it's kind of nuts. So the results of all this integration, now the FujiNet on the Atari can be used 
from any application inside the system. So you can use it from inside of Atari BASIC. You can use it from inside the action programming language directly. You can take and compile your code over the network and ship it back and so on. You just fill in, uh, you know, you, for, the, for the SIO side, all that a, a FujiNet program has to do is fill in the device control block that SIOV uses and then call SIOV. If you get an error, then you call status to get the actual error code. And it works at any time because SIO is in the operating system ROM. There's no DOS that needs to be loaded so that you could even put this on cartridge. And I've been there, done that. So it works. So the results on the CIO side of things with the end handler mean that you can even use the end device inside of BASIC. And if you look at this particular chunk of BASIC code right here, you've got uh, three lines of code are basically all you need to take and open a connection to ICANN has IP and read back the IP address that it sends across the slot. And this is all using the existing IO commands that are in BASIC itself. Open, input, print, close, and so on. It's really easy to use. So, so. What if I do want to learn some more about this stuff? Well, here's a technical reference manual, which has been scanned and is posted at Atari Mania. I checked it yesterday. I made sure it's still there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Altaria hardware reference manual, excuse me, um, that we referenced earlier. Um, I really like Jamie Lindino's book, Breakout. Um, which describes a lot of things about that device. Um, I haven't finished my own book for MIT Press yet. It's still un in process. Um, I have a copy of that book here. If you ping me, I may send it to you. Um, there was a talk that I gave when I first met this gentleman five years ago at VCF East in New Jersey. And that's been recorded and that's published on the internet. And so that's where to learn more. Again, this talk will be published by BCF, so you'll be able, able to find it. And here's how to find Tom and me. I got two email addresses because I'm a professor at UW. And we're open for questions. One of my administrative assistants, back when I had a lot of people reporting to me, said, sometimes the less you tell them, the more they remember. And I hope we're successful today. Yep. Questions flooding into the mind of the concerned young person today. Yes. I got actually two questions. One is, is there anything on the Atari that you don't emulate that, you don't emulate that you're going, planning on adding? Not at the moment, but that's the beautiful thing about what we have. Since it's an open project, uh, we're letting anybody basically come in and we can add new devices to the firmware. We've, we still, we're only using like a third of our available firmware space. We've got plenty of space that we can add more devices. Yeah, and then my second question is, what other hardware on Verizon? Are you looking at like Spectrum or anything like yes, that? Yes, yes. He's going to give yes. a whole talk on yes, that subject that's tomorrow. tomorrow morning. <laughs> the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> yes. So this might be kind of a dumb question. You talked a lot about the interface between the Atari and the, the expansion device, but what's the hardware that runs in the little expansion device? It's an ESP32 microcontroller. If if the airport people had let me bring my screwdrivers with me, I'd take it apart and show you. Yeah, they don't like that very much. <laughs> Yeah, they make sure I don't bring in anything sharp. So, you mentioned that you were able to program from the IP. Has anyone written any malware for this? <laughs> <laughs> huh? He wants to. Okay, the question is Has anyone written any malware for this? No. <laughs> but, but if you do, okay, good job. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of. What would malware consist of here? This is a very old machine. Yeah, I don't know what you could do. 
And oh darn, I formatted the flag. If I was going to be, you know, going to a website, they'd have to write code that got loaded into the system to be a keyboard logger to try to capture my keystrokes and then separately, surreptitiously, using the internet, send that message to somebody else. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying it'd be a good idea. <laughs> well, to, to replay history, start with the Mars worm. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Question, any other next one? Any other questions? My late wife used to joke that if you ask an engineer what time it is, he'll build you a clock. <laughs> and what people really want to know is what time is it? And this is a case where we started off um, to not over answer your question. Yes. We yeah. tried very hard. <laughs> right. And again, sometimes the less you tell them, the more they remember. Yes, sir. So in my Cocoa community, there's a whole variety of basics. We've got the OS9 operating system, this Flex. Each of these has its own idea of devices. Yes. Are you lucky in Atari that you don't have a multitude of operating systems and everybody really observes this one device model? Well, that's the interesting part there. There's a common operating system with a common device interface. And most of the disk operating systems that build on top of that leverage that directly. So all of that transparently just works. There are some interesting exceptions, but for the most part, that's the, that, that's the situation. And it's funny that you should mention on the COCO, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the COCO bring up tomorrow. And yes, the challenge is, I, I will say, okay, I'll take a small little aside here to talk. The Atari spoiled us just, just a bit. <laughs> Because we're now we're doing bring ups on the Apple II, the Commodore 64, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I will say that before doing the Apple II bring up, I had no idea that Apple's had so many edges. So, uh, holy crap, uh, premature optimization at a premium there, and it makes things interesting. So, so the Atari system was an attractive nuisance for him. No. <laughs> but the flip side is, when he finally gets around to finishing the eight bidders. So I was involved in the Amiga architecture. And it didn't have, obviously USB was invented a decade later, so it doesn't have USB in it. And um, the I, I had, been, I was actually working at a company as my main job, trying to pave the internet. And I was working on the Amiga as a consultant, badge number three. So I was aware of, communication in general. And so the, the change that we made to the Amiga design is the Atari 8-bits had DMA for video and audio, but it didn't have DMA for communications. So all the high volume data traffic that you get off of modern communications isn't well supported in the system. On the other hand, it's a 1.8 megahertz. 8-bit CPU. What's in this thing? Quad-core Intel 64-bit yeah. 1.8 gigahertz. Yeah. So it screams compared to the volume that these older machines are designed for. However, the Amiga has DMA not only for video and for audio, for but everything. for communications. So when somebody starts building this for the Amiga, we can hook it into their drivers, which can more likely handle the data traffic involved. So that SIO channel has a DMA? No, this doesn't have a DMA, but it does have Wi-Fi in it. So it can, fortunately, most internet protocols have flow control naturally built into them. Certainly, S, you know, UDP and S, right. This was something I have ran into firsthand. My experience from FujiNet comes from prior experiences of trying to utilize connectivity solutions that previously existed for the 8-bit machines. And we had a lot. There were people that were basically taking 
and saying, okay, I'll take a crystal semiconductor 8900 Ethernet chip and I'll drop it onto the bus. Okay, I'm done. No, you're not. Because now you have to take and write a TCP IP stack. Oh, and then you realize that TCP IP stack is now taking up 60 of your 64K of address space. <laughs> and um, so what are you going to do? So you leave out things like the flow control, the TCP window resizing. And uh, yeah, so my, my approach with FujiNet and our approach with FujiNet was literally in a direct response to that going, no, don't do it like that. Put it on something that can handle the load and let the computer take and talk to it at a leisurely place. Now, as and far it's, as it's, it's, the Atari 8-bit speed is a lot smaller than the performance of one of these guys. Yeah. But then there's a whole lot of, what's it, Moore's Law in yeah. here that's not in the 8-bits. Exactly. And as far as the Amiga version is concerned, the work that we do on each platform bring up gives us a vector on to 10 more machines each time. And the work that Jeff Peepmeyer is currently doing to bring it to the Macintosh right now uh, is going to be the direct vector for us to bring it onto the Amiga. And another one of Joe's machines, we just got the 2600 version started to breathe uh, a couple days ago. It's booting. It, it, he it, sent it, me a it, photograph. Yeah, it, it, booted, it booted at Video Olympics. So, yay. <laughs> World domination. <laughs> Yeah. I would say I was impressed how quickly y'all got up to speed on doing things in the cocoa environment. Yeah. My specialty is, thank you, my specialty is cross-platform engineering. I, I'm okay with using hundreds of different tool chains to take and, and connect something together and I can come up to speed on platform very quickly. Yep. When you're working with Was, he was a practicer back in the day. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was offered a job at Apple three times by Steve Jobs, and the bait was work with Woz. <laughs> and the downside was twofold. Um, I really liked working in Atari. We used to joke about paying to work there. You know, like there'd be a coin, a coffee can on your desk with a little slot, and you'd throw quarters in every once in a while. Because we used to joke about that because it was so much fun. And obviously the bait to go to Apple Computer would be to work with Was, but Was was a savant, but I didn't think that he was capable of protecting me from jobs. And that's, I'll leave it at that. That's a detractor. <laughs> On the other hand, we were buds. We were exchanging information all the time. I understood how the Apple II worked. Right? And I understand how he did his bus, and I understand how he made it plug and play by allowing you to plug in your driver code on ROM, as well as, um, you know, as long as you're in the right slot. And so I had the privilege five years ago of successfully nominating Steve Wozniak to be an IEEE fellow. Oh. So we're both IEEE fellows now. And I just. You know, I dropped out of a PhD program at Berkeley because I also had a company. And they said, oh, well, then don't waste your time in graduate school. Go make money and give us some. <laughs> so I did. I gave them a quarter million dollars in the late 1980s. They were very happy, but they didn't name anything after me. Uh, but now, in my semi I failed retirement. <laughs> I have 84 students this quarter, and I'm busy passing on how to be a successful electrical engineer, computer scientist to the next generation, while I still remember what to tell them, because at some point I'll forget or I won't care. Or as they used to say at Microsoft, death is career limiting. <laughs> career limiting. Career. So yeah, um, in fact, tangentially to this, so, I've been threatening to finish a book for the MIT Press on the Atari 8-bit computers. And I've submitted the work on what are the lessons learned from the game console and how did they end up in the Atari 8-bit computers. And I've written the stuff that starts with having shifted what happened in the market and what are the lessons we learned that animated what became the Amiga computer. 
And what I'm working on with my students in the center is how to write games for it on it. Because it was designed from scratch to be a, something to write retro games on. I had the great privilege of working in a building adjacent to the building where the Atari arcade designers were. So I had lunch with them. I got to see their stuff all the time. And so, for example, we put two-dimensional video scrolling in the Atari 8-bit computers because we wanted to be able to do Superbug. <laughs> and I built a demo of Superbug and demonstrated it you know, as part of the acceptance okay, we've decided we're going to ship this computer, if it can do that. But I didn't stick around to actually write the code. And they didn't recruit anybody else to finish the code either. So there's still people out there waiting for me, or my students, to finish Superbook. <laughs> and that's going to go into the book. I'm going to have to finish that first. Yep. Done with that distraction. Um, more questions? Done those 68,000 machine yet? We we we've been Jeff's been working on the Mac uh, now Mac. for about uh, five months, and it's it's functioning now. It's booting software off of the network. Uh, now I'm actually my task right now is to write the configuration program, but I also have to take and work out the low level protocol on the integrated WAS machine for. Uh, talking, doing things that was never intended to do, like you know, network traffic and doing Fujinet control traffic. It's possible. I just have to uh, figure out what bits to twiddle. Now, if I recall correctly, they just have a communications port in the back of the Mac, just like the Amiga, right? The uh, you know they have yeah they have the two eighty five thirty ports. But us being the masochists that we are, um, we decided to actually use the floppy port, which is hooked up to the Waz machine. So. Made my job a lot harder, but it'll be more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, no, I. What, so it's I got, told. It presumably runs a lot faster than It does. Need. Yes. Right. It does. So I. When Waz had found out that we were working on the Apple II FujiNet, and when yeah, I described. Fault. Yeah. Yeah. And when I described to him that we were using his disk 2 controller design to implement a networking uh, interface, his response was quite simple, that's insane. That's <laughs> <laughs> and he was a prankster. <laughs> Best reply ever. <laughs> so are you using floppy boot? Yes, it thinks you're booting a floppy. Yes, it thinks you're, yeah. We're having to, yeah, we're implementing the low level floppy flux, yeah, protocol, but we're also implementing the DCD protocol, which was used by the first hard drive as well. So that's also supported. And getting all of that to work, Apple overloaded that floppy port 15 times over. And us working through all of the edge cases to make sure all of that just works is proving to be interesting. Uh, I, who, yeah, yes. So, are you actually, does it think it's getting signals from a read then? Yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, well, when you step back and think, okay, so I still, in my retirement. Well, the old audio cassettes that you put into the, um, your cassette player to play CDs through it? That's kind of, that's sort of what's happening here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Okay, when I teach microprocessor system design now to my students, um, we talk about the hierarchy of memory, right? So those old machines didn't have caches, but we started seeing caches in the 80s, and by the end of the 80s, you couldn't buy processors that didn't have caches, and you know, Intel, the, the 386 was the last cacheless Intel architecture, and after that, they went on board Motorola did the same thing with the 68,000 series, right? And so there's layers of cache. But when you teach memory hierarchy, you start with the static RAM in one or two layers on the CPU itself, and then you have offboard caches, and then there is local mass storage, and then there's the internet. And today, the internet is crazy fast. How many of you paid attention to your data rates on 5G? Right? You see TV ads now, get, cut the cable all together. Yeah. Just depend on the local cell tower. It screams. It's, 
it can peak over a gigabit with latencies that are in the small number of milliseconds. And when that's true, your availability to the world is enormous, right? Um, it's hard to wedge it all into the floppy port, but it's easier to wedge it into the floppy port than it is to the old 850 yeah. dual, oh. you know, 19.2 kilobyte. I, I thank Scott Scheiman for doing the hard work for making the 850 possible, but I will say that part of what I was, the big part of what I was doing with the Fujinet was in direct response to some of the shortcomings of the 850 itself. Well, he didn't envision you either. I know. It's okay. It's okay. You have to explain what an 850 is. An 850 is a serial port interface. It provided four serial ports and it provided a parallel port. It was the expansion interface. And its whole purpose was to provide communications out to the rest of the world. And the only way that they could actually do this uh, was that the 850 operated in one of two modes. You had a block write mode which used SIO packets to send out to the serial ports, but you could only write like that. You couldn't read back. In order to read, what you had to do was you had to put the 850 in a mode called concurrent mode, where the serial port is just reflecting what comes in off the, serial, off, off the SIO port and vice versa. And it's just doing that on a bit banging basis. And because of that, a whole bunch of things that they tried to design into the 850 couldn't be used. You couldn't, for example, say, I want to see what the status of the RTS line is without dropping out of concurrent mode. And while that's happening, well, you might lose information, and so on, and so on, and so on. Well, worse, Scott Scheinman, everybody designing a legacy Atari serial bus devices, they were using the 6507s. Why? Because they were really cheap. Yeah, and that's what we them. used in the video game console. They didn't have interrupts. 6507, in every Atari peripheral, 6507, 6532. And not having interrupts is really crippling in terms of system performance. Yeah. And, but because they added that interrupt, that, that interrupt in there, we're not having to pull the network devices and having to pull for network traffic. We can literally just go, oh, okay. Uh, it, it gives us a signal and boom, there we go. <laughs> we, can, we can deal with it right then and there. And it worked great. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Well then, thank you for your attention. Thank you.